Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, we'll also have it on the screen for you. We have a lot of scripture to cover today and some really powerful points and application for us today. And we'll see a behind the scenes look at how God orchestrates people's salvation. We'll see that the Holy Spirit and visions and dreams help break down barriers between two different groups of people. And we'll see once again what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and fills believers, what, what happens to them. And uh, you, you, may not be, uh, you may not have been here in the beginning of this series where we learned that Luke, um, he was a convert of the disciples. He was not a disciple himself, but he has a gospel book. Uh, he was the author of Luke and the author of the book of Acts. And he is strategically showing us how the Holy Spirit empowers the church, empowers believers to bring the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And for the remaining portion of the book of Acts, we're gonna see the gospel doors have been opened to the Gentiles, which are those who are not Jews, any, any nation that's not uh, from Jewish descent. And the gospel opens up to them and God uses the church to minister to the gospel. And so that's where we're, uh, we're at now in Acts chapter 10. And that will be a primary focus of, of the people that will be reached. And uh, there's some important context for you when it, comes to, when it comes to this. And we're gonna see in this scripture that Peter still needed some previous views of his Jewish laws to be um, removed from his faith or his way of life because he once was a Jew and he was still um, practicing some Jewish things like dietary restrictions and also who he's allowed to fellowship with, whether he's allowed to eat with Gentiles or not. And so we're gonna see that the Lord has to uh, remove this belief system through the story today. And this is a fascinating story of visions and animals being let down in, in a sheet and, and, and God using that. So let's get right into it. Um, Acts chapter 10, verse one. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. So he would be a Gentile and was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, and he was praying, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter he is staying with Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. Look at the details in that. This angel was specific. <clears throat> as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. As you may realize, Rome has dominated many territories and so there's an Italian captain in the Roman um, army and uh, his name is Cornelius. And so he's a Gentile, but he's a God-fearing Gentile, which is interesting. Uh, we believe that he learned the Jewish faith or Judaism through the culture around him. And so he was most likely practicing more of the, Jude, uh, the Jewish faith than he was a Christian. So he, he believed God and he even prayed to him and he even did offerings to him. He did by, by helping others around him, he's a generous man. And so God saw that. And I think that's interesting for us to take note. What we're gonna find out is, is that he wasn't a born again Christian or believer, but he was a person who did believe in God. And God hears people's prayers. If you're an unbeliever today and you pray out to God, God hears you. If you do good works for other people, God sees that. And these things got to God's eyes and ears. And so God wanted to do something. God wanted to respond 
in a special way. He wanted to send Peter to preach the missing piece in Cornelius' life. This is important today because we have in our society people who do believe in God, who do believe in doing good things, but they don't necessarily have faith in Jesus Christ. This is important. There are many people who believe God, but have never confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so God wants to finish this part. He wants to bless them and help them. His grace is sending, um, is sending these men out to go find Peter, and Peter needs to come back and share a message. So let's go on to now Peter's um, encounter with God. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, this is verse 9, Peter went up on the flat roof, on a flat roof to pray. I would love to have a flat roof to pray on. I try to get on my roof to put some Christmas lights on, and I was scared. I, I was, I'm getting down. I'm getting down. The, the grade, the slope is just too steep. So, but it would be cool, you know, get away, go on the roof and pray. Can you imagine how cool that would be? Kick back, talk to God, look into the sky. I think that'd be awesome. And then like every person, it says it was about noon and he was hungry. So Peter got hungry. And, but while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now today we might look at that word and, and interpret a certain way. But in the Greek, it was he was overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord or he was in a state of praying to the Lord so much that he had a vision. And we see that later as we keep reading. He had a vision from the Lord. He didn't fall into some trance where he was incapable of controlling himself or something like that. Verse 11, he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. And in this sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Yeah. <laughs> right, men? It's time to hunt. It's time to feast. Ladies, if you like to hunt too, great. Hey, come join us, yeah. It's time to eat. Thank God for this. This was, this was God's approval. I like different things to eat. I need a variety. I have a, I have a palate that needs more than just lamb. So he's opening this, the broad spectrum of all foods, okay? But there's something deeper here that's going on. And it says, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. And Peter says, no, Lord. Now, this is the third time Peter argued with the Lord. He has not learned yet. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. So there must have been some impure, unclean animals in this vision, in this sheet. And he's like, I'm not going to eat that. I've never done that. I've been devout. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. <clears throat> The same vision was repeated three times. There's two reasons why. God was trying to get it through Peter's thick skull. And God says things three times for emphasis to get it through all of our skulls and to listen to him and obey him, that it's important to him. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. All right? Now, this is important to understand because in the Jewish law, especially in Leviticus and in the Old Testament, there were restrictions on food that the Jews were not allowed to eat. And, and here's why. Because if they did, they often were in fellowship with the surrounding nations that were pagan and heathen. And so God's idea and program of separating his people from all their nations is you're not going to eat everything they eat and you're not going to do all the things they do, you are holy and set apart. How many know that's still the case morally and spiritually today, that we are meant to be separate in our behaviors and our thinking, and that we're supposed to follow God's ways of thinking and behaviors? That is still today. We should live separate. But this is a ceremonial or civil law not the moral law of the Old Testament. The moral law is the Ten Commandments. This was a ceremonial or civil law, so to say, more civil than anything, 
where in order for them to look different from the surrounding nations, they could not eat certain foods. If they did, they were most likely fellowshipping with the surrounding nations, and therefore the surrounding nations would infiltrate and uh, contaminate, so to say, God's people, and they would walk away from him. Well, how many know they ended up doing that themselves anyway? Because the battle's not just on the outside, it's on the inside. <clears throat> Let me get to that. Mark chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, turn to it. We'll have it on the screen, but keep your finger in Acts 10. Mark chapter 7, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and they, they, they obey the law, but then they kind of twist some things to work out in their favor, and they put these laws and restrictions on people, but don't even apply them to themselves, and Jesus confronts them, and one of the things he confronts them on is the law said to honor your father and your mother, to take care of your mother and your father, and when they're in need, take care of their needs. How many grandparents could say Amen. <clears throat> well, um, they made a rule that if you've already dedicated your offering to the temple or to the Lord and, and bringing that offering to the Lord, some kind of offering, most likely money, then you can't use that to help your needy family. Jesus confronts them and says that that's wrong to ignore your needy family members and instead give it to the church or to, to the temple at that time for your worship. Here's the reality, Jesus knew this, the Pharisees liked their money. And we do have spiritual leaders and, and unfortunate pastors in our society who also like their money too, don't they? And so you check the motive and Jesus sees that the heart of the issue and he confronts this issue. And then he teaches a deeper lesson here that it's not what's on the outside that defiles you, but it's on the inside that defiles you. And this is what he says in verse 14. Then Jesus called the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. So it's not what you eat that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. <clears throat> then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd and his disciples asked him what he meant by, this, by the parable he had just used. He said, don't you understand either? Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. So even Jesus is already saying these foods are acceptable in God's eyes. All right, now the focus has always been for the Jews and for the Pharisees, physical things, if, if I touch them, I'm defiled, okay? I'm no longer holy. Jesus is saying, let's get to the heart of the issue. What, you, what comes out of your body, what comes out of your mind and, and your heart, that's what defiles you, all right? And he goes on to explain that. He says, and then he added, it is what comes from the inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. So food doesn't defile you. Now, here's the thing. This is talking about spiritual things. Okay, we're affected spiritually by what's in our heart, what we allow to come in through our eyes and our ears can defile us. This is why we need to guard our hearts and our minds and be careful what we look at, what we listen to, what music we listen to, what movies we watch, things that we always are feeding our hearts and our minds with because it can defile your heart. The Pharisees focused on physical things. Jesus was focusing on the spiritual things, okay? So that God is breaking down this barrier that kept them from fellowship with Gentiles. Why? Because he wants the Jews, these Jewish believers who are now Christians, he wants them to go to the Gentiles and tell them about Jesus. So he can, Peter can sit down and have fellowship with a Gentile because he is now allowed to eat with them the same foods they eat. And then as he does this, he can preach the gospel. So we should eat with people who are not Christians, but we should not participate in the life that they live out especially if it's not of God, all right? 
That was like a weak clap, but that's okay. It's, a, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but this is important because there have been Christians that taught, what are you doing sitting with those sinners? What are you doing eating with those sinners? I'm trying to share the love of Jesus with them. What are you talking about? Now, there are certain places that you should go and not go because, you know, you want to avoid the appearance of evil, as Scripture says. You know, let's, let's, let's love people where they are and let's bring them into Christ, but we don't have to go where they are all the time in certain situations or contexts. Are you following me on that? Okay. You can be a missionary somewhere else. You don't have to be a missionary at the counter at the bar. Just saying. All right. Now, maybe, maybe you have the gifting to do that and refrain. Okay, but you need to be very careful. Also, by the way, the Bible shows us that they go two by two a lot when they evangelize. Having a brother or sister in Christ with you to help you, okay? All right, let's go, let's go forward. Peter was perplexed, as probably many would be. Verse 17, what could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gate. They asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. Wouldn't that be nice for God to speak to you like that today? Lord, I need help deciding on this purchase, or I need help finding the woman or the man of my life. Could you spell out that in such great detail as you did for Peter? <laughs> he was in prayer, so just so you know. Okay, so have a relationship with the Lord. He can speak to you. But can I just say something? Do not say the Lord told me, and it's actually a form of manipulation. Just saying that real quick. That's not godly, all right? Okay, I might get an email about that one. No, nah, sure. <laughs> so Peter went down and said, I'm the man you were looking for. Why have you come? And they said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day, he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. When I was reading this, again, it cracked me up. Because remember, Peter was hungry when he went up to pray? I think he wanted to eat. So he's like, let's just, let's stay overnight. Let's eat this, this delicious food. But do you know what Peter did? Peter already began practicing the vision. He already began pr practicing the rebuke from the Lord to don't make anything unclean that I said is clean. And he invited the Gentiles in. This would be unheard of. You wouldn't do this and you wouldn't sit down around a table and eat because it meant that you are in fellowship together. Okay? So this is huge. So he's, he is obeying the Lord. He's obeying the Holy Spirit. Verse 24, they arrived in Caesarea the following day and Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So Cornelius saw this angel and he gave him specific instructions and he's like so amazed by this that he gets everyone to come to the house. Close relatives, friends, um, even his servants in his home, they're all here. It's what's called in the Greek oikos, which is, it, it is like the yogurt, but we're talking about the people of God, the household, okay? The household was all together. Friends, family, servants of, of him, they were all there. He got so excited. He's like, you gotta come here. What's gonna happen next? Isn't that cool? Can I give a little side note real quick? Um, can we not wait for an angel to tell us to invite people to our house to read scripture? Can we not wait for the heavens to open up and some vision happen before we decide to bring someone with us to church? Why do we have to wait for that? People are hungry for the truth. People are hungry for community. They, they are longing for God more than they realize. We're finding that people are more likely to attend church if you actually invite them than assume that they don't want to come to church. And why not open up your home, have a cup of coffee, have some muffins and talk about Jesus or just get to know people around you that live in your neighborhood or something? Why not? 
We do not need to wait for heavens to part and angels speak to us and then, then we follow whatever instructions. But this was a special occasion because the door was opening to a group of people who were unreached. And so God had to do some powerful signs and wonders from heaven to get this through to Peter's head. All right, so we're gonna go forward here. Uh, I lost my place, where am I? Okay, okay, 28. Peter told them, you know it is against our laws for, Jewish, for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Isn't that good? So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, four days ago, I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. I got two takeaways for us right now and still, instead of waiting to the end. Uh, number one, it's about prayer. Prayer is important, church. Prayer is where God and man meet, where God's will begins to be unveiled on earth. Peter's praying. Cornelius is praying. God shows up. Sounds like a good reason to go home and pray today. Our Father, who art in heaven, we pray it all the time, right? Hallowed be thy name, which means holy is your name, and may your name be kept holy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray those words. Do we realize what we're praying? We're praying for heaven to be on earth. We're praying for God to reveal his will, unveil himself on earth. Can you imagine how much work could get done for the kingdom if the church prayed? Let's pray. Let's pray. A man who feared God but was not a follower of Christ was praying. Let's pray and see what God wants to do. Secondly, God is preparing hearts and orchestrating divine moments for salvation to occur. God is preparing hearts and orchestrating divine moments for salvation to occur. I have good news for you. Parents, friends, family members, I have good news for you. The Lord is working out divine appointments and moments for salvation. What we typically do is we try too hard to see people get saved to the point that we can even turn people off or turn people away. We ourselves will be afraid. And you know what? There's, there, I, I respect that and I get it because we don't want people to perish without knowing Jesus Christ. But we can become so fearful that we try to get people saved or we try to get people to believe in God on our terms rather than the way God wants to do it. Do you think that Peter expected for Gentiles to come to his door this day and then have them over for dinner and then he would go to a Gentile's house and he's about to preach the gospel. And do you think that this, he woke up and he was like, this is gonna be a great day. I'm gonna hang out with Gentiles. No, God works in mysterious and amazing ways behind the scenes. <clears throat> this Tuesday, we were praying as a staff and we were sharing testimonies. And one of our staff members said that for years they been, had been trying to reach their niece for the Lord. A lot of context behind the story I can't share. It's personal and I can't give names. But this niece had gone through some family struggles and trials and there was an absent parent and all those things. And the staff member had been trying to get her to join her for online Bible study because they lived in different states and all these things. And she really just didn't want anything to do with it. 
And then the Lord told her, and this is an important distinction, the Lord told her basically to surrender your niece to me and let me do what I need to do rather than you try and do it the way you're doing it. So it's not giving up on people. It's not, you're not stopping praying. You're not saying you're not available. You're saying, you know what? I'm not gonna do it the way I'm trying to do it. I'm gonna let God work in his mysterious ways instead. And would you know that about a couple years later, if I'm not mistaken, a man came into her life and invited her niece to go to church with her. And all of a sudden now, she wants to know more about God and is now reaching out to her aunt to ask about Jesus and Bible studies. And now she has opened her heart to the Lord. Amen. There's a couple lessons in that. One, trust the Lord that his believers are working in other states. And be careful that you're not trying to get the glory for the salvation. There could be that heart motive. Of course, we all want people to be saved for heaven's sake, for their sake, right? But let's be careful. Let's not forget there's other Christians in the world that God wants to use, that God has angels and that God has his church around the world and he is working. So take a deep breath today and give your family members and friends to the Lord. God is working. He orchestrated this encounter. He can orchestrate the next one. Amen. He orchestrated this encounter. He can orchestrate the next one. Then Peter replied in verse 34. So he's ready to hear, they're ready to hear this message. And Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. So he's listening to those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel. And he's learning now that it's more than just Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So true salvation, true peace is not just in praying to God or uh, you know, you know, just doing good works for him. True peace with God, true salvation is by having faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 37, and this is what he does. He, he pulls out the gospel in 10 verses. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. So apparently Cornelius' household had knowledge of the gospel. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Hmm, did you see that verse? Verse 38. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Let's pause for a moment. There's... Ways that the devil oppresses, and the main one is this. He gets you to give in to your flesh and your sinful ways. That's why in James 4, the Bible says, flee, flee from the devil. Run from the devil because he's trying to oppress you once again with sinful choices. So he's tempting you, okay? And sometimes it just comes from within as James also teaches too. Our flesh is weak. And the devil knows that. So he oppresses people also through other things in our society. He wants you to, de to be depressed. He wants you to be overwhelmed. He wants you to feel despair. This is the life that the devil wants for you. But we just read, and, and Peter is so accurate, that he came, Jesus came, to set people who have been oppressed by sin and the devil, he has come to set them free. And my friends, that's exactly what Jesus did in the gospels. That's exactly what he did. And the church has been doing that too since we've been reading the book of Acts, right? And today, he wants to set you free in this place if you're oppressed by something in your life. That is not the life that God has for you. He wants to deliver you from the devil's schemes and works and your own sinful struggles. You know, sometimes we're, we are our own worst enemy. 
and we continue to give in to the things that are actually oppressing us. And I pray that the Lord would reveal that today. Verse 39, and the apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, <clears throat> but God raised him to life on the third day. So look at this, this is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. And God allowed him to appear, not to just the general public, but, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. He's talking about the women, the men that were his followers. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Wow, what a great, just awesome example of how to share the gospel. I want to pause for a moment again. <clears throat> Saving faith. There is a faith like Cornelius who believed God. And so he prayed to God and he did good works for God. But his faith was in what he was doing rather than what Jesus did for him. The missing piece for Cornelius and his household was Jesus. He needed Jesus. Friends, I have to tell you this. Even James says that even demons believe in God. That doesn't, if we have belief that God exists, that's more head knowledge than it is heart. We must believe in Jesus Christ as the one who's done the work for us. And this is really key what he says here. For the forgiveness of sin, that implies that you know you have sinned and I have sinned, amen? And so if we acknowledge that we have sinned, then we know we need a savior. That saving faith is to leave the old way behind and take on the new way of life. And today, some of us could be in church our entire lives and they've done that. And you know what I call that? They, don't, they have not put their faith in Jesus yet. They put their faith in church attendance, giving offerings, uh, praying, things like that. But I call that churchianity. There could be people in this place today who have been thinking, if I do these things, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. It's not what you have done that gets you to heaven, it's what Jesus Christ has done to set you free from your sin. <clears throat> Amen. And so he's asking you to trust in Christ. He's asking me, all of us, to put our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, we must acknowledge that we have them. And as he is preaching, this is amazing what happens next. Okay, and we're gonna take a moment to respond today, just so you know. So just mentally, physically, spiritually, just prepare yourself. Because we're gonna sing together, okay? And we're gonna pray, and we're gonna give our hearts to the Lord and, and give our lives to the Lord. But as he's preaching the word, they're interrupted. He's interrupted. Verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. How did they know? How did they know that the Holy Spirit was poured on the Gentiles just like it was poured on them in Acts 2? For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. They were speaking in other tongues and languages they didn't understand or a heavenly language from the Lord. And they were praying in tongues and they were also praising God. It was the outer working of the inner working of the Holy Spirit in their life. This means that as they were hearing Peter preached, they believed in Jesus Christ and therefore God wanted to bestow upon them the presence of the Holy Spirit to help them continue to follow. This was the Gentile Pentecost, just like we saw in Acts 2, the Jewish Pentecost. This is the Gentile Pentecost to empower the Gentiles now to also preach the gospel. Praise God. Then Peter asked, 
Can anyone object to their being baptized? Wait a minute, I thought they just got baptized. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now he's saying, well, look, they must be believers because they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now we should water baptize them for a public declaration and confession. Anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So verse 48, so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days, and that's exactly what Peter did to disciple them and help them grow. There's a difference between water baptism and spirit baptism. The baptizer in water baptism is the pastor or the discipler, and the pastor comes alongside that person and puts them underwater completely. It's called immersion or submersion, and you immerse or submerge them in the water and that's that public declaration that I'm a follower of Christ. When you're baptized in the presence of the Holy Spirit, it's Jesus who pours out his spirit over you and submerges you spiritually. Like you're underwater, but you're under the Holy Spirit. And he covers you. And let me tell you something, we hear this all the time. When people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay, they say, I'm, they say everything changes for me. I was a believer. I was already a Christian, but now I have power to resist even more the devil. I have power. I, have, I can tell that the Lord is with me. I can tell that I, I can do greater things for him because I have the power of the Holy Spirit because I don't have the power in me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Yes. Those, those strongholds cannot continue in your life because the Holy Spirit breaks them. Those struggles, you, they're no longer struggles for you. You have victory over those things that have been a struggle for years. The Holy Spirit gives you power. The Greek, in the Greek, the word power is dunami, which is where we get our word dynamite. An explosive power to break through those strongholds and to do great things for the Lord. Why would we want that? Let's be open to all that God has for us. I would encourage you today to be open to what God has for you. He has the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you and to help you follow him and do great things for him. Now, the rest of the scripture today, we're not gonna cover word for word, but Acts 11, one through 18, I just wanna summarize in the first few verses, it says, soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea. The Gentiles have received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them. Then Peter told them exactly what had happened. So Peter goes through exactly what happens. He recaps everything. And then it says this. Uh, in verse 15, as I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. He's referring to Acts 2. Then I thought the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? Verse 18, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Praise God. Just so you know, this is the door of the gospel open even further for all people to come in. Every nation, every tongue, everything, every person on the earth the gospel was always meant for everyone, but it was done in stages. And it started with first with the Jews and then the Gentiles. And today we're here because Jesus loves us too. Amen. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that even though we are sinners, Jesus died for us. And that if you accept Jesus into your life and believe him as your Lord and Savior, you will be forgiven of your sin. You will receive eternal life and you will also have a desire to live a holy new life. That's the simple gospel. You're gonna change. You can't change without the Holy Spirit changing you on the inside. And so you must surrender to him, yes. 
So let's stand together. I'm gonna be really transparent with you here. I think it's a both and situation. What am I about to say? Do you, you guys believe in spiritual warfare, right? You believe in the spiritual realm? Obviously, because we believe in God, angels. We know there's demons. I know that we were quiet today because we're probably listening and taking everything in. But I'm sensing spiritual warfare in this place right now. There is a resistance to hear the gospel. It's so strong right now, I cannot deny it, and I need to call it out. If you're closing your ears off to the gospel, that's the oppression of the devil. If you're super tired right now and you couldn't even listen and you rolled your eyes because you wanted me to be done, that's the devil. He's distracted you with the things of this world. He kept you late, up late last night. You kept yourself up late last night. And you know what? God is so merciful and gracious that even though that may have happened, the Lord still loves you and wants to change your life right now. I can sense a fight in here. And if there's a fight in here, there's probably a fight out there. Because the devil does not want you to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's more than just salvation from your sin. It's about following Jesus with your life. That means surrendering things in your life that you can't let go of. And we heard a word a couple weeks ago in this house that we're holding on to things, and I believe it's true. We're holding on to Jesus, and we're holding on to this world, and they do not mix. We need to repent today. We need to stop with that. We need to stop playing games. He gave his all. I want to encourage you to give your all to Jesus. His arms were spread wide and his feet nailed to the cross. My third point is this. There is no other name under heaven which we may be saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. You can't save yourself by coming to church. You can't save yourself by saying pretty prayers to God and doing good works. You must be saved by putting your life and your faith in Jesus. And that means you're accepting that you're a sinner in need of salvation. And he is ready to do that today. A spiritual change. Secondly, and lastly, Jesus longs to give you his Holy Spirit and empower you so that you can serve the Lord in greater measure, with greater power, greater effectiveness. And we have closed ourselves off because we hear the word tongues and we get scared or weird about that. But let me tell you something, not once did I make it about tongues because that's just the evidence or the outer working of the Holy Spirit coming in. Let me tell you another thing too, because I've heard this lie in the community and I'm tired of it. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved and go to heaven. That is a false teaching. <clears throat> That's a false teaching to scare people away. That's from the devil. The Holy Spirit loves you too. He's a personal being. They call him in the Bible counselor, standby wonderful counselor too because he's God in spirit and he is here for you to help you he is ready to help you break these things in your life and set you free so I'm going to invite you to come up even as I'm speaking prayer team stay where you are let's leave room for the altars listen to me things are going to wait today I'm not saying we're going to stay here all day just another moment here just another moment, would you come forward if there is someone in your life or if it's you in your life that you need to intercede for, would you come forward and let the Lord break the oppression of the devil and the oppression of sin in your life and you're gonna need to confess it, you're gonna need to repent of it, you're gonna need to tell him, get specific with him and let him know this has been shackling me and I wanna be set free and I want your Holy Spirit to help me walk for you and to share the love of Jesus Christ with my neighbors and friends. Because right now is a moment that God wants to pour out himself to you. And listen, Christians, we're guilty too. We're guilty. We, we've, we've given our faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, but then we go back into works. We go back into doing good things for God, and now we feel better. Galatians, a whole book of Galatians confronts that. 
Don't go back to your works of salvation. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Change your heart back to following Jesus first and foremost. Not doing good works and saying we're good. Anyone can do good works in this world. But we need to put our faith and keep our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you work in this place right now? Lord, I pray against the enemy, any demonic presence in this place. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. It must leave. It must go. We pray for deliverance in this place, for blinders to be taken off, the stronghold, God, the grip of the enemy, the grip of oppression, the grip of sin must be released in Jesus' name right now. We loose it right now. Lord, we bind up the, bro the brokenness, we bind up the evil spirits, and we loose the Holy Spirit, Lord, in this place. Your word says in Matthew 16, you gave the apostles, the disciples, the authority to loose and bind here on earth. And we pray right now in Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would send out any demons that are in the people's lives right now. And Lord, that you would deliver people in this place from depression, sorrow, sadness, whatever it may be. Despair, God, we pray today, deliverance from that right now. Brokenness, Lord God, heal today in Jesus' name. Lord, for bondage and addictions, God, we pray for a breaking right now in Jesus' name. We do that, God, by giving our hearts to you. We get, do that, God, by acknowledging that we need Jesus in our lives. And we ask, God, that you would fill us with your spirit. Replace the old with the new. Replace our old self with the new self, with the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, we can't do this without you. We acknowledge that, and we need your spirit in our lives. We want to be different. We want to live change, but we need your Holy Spirit to do it. So fill us in this place from the back of the room to the front of the altar, God. Fill this place with your presence. Freedom in this place in Jesus' name. Let's sing the name of Jesus today and let's let God work his power in this place in our hearts.